Welcome back to Adam Salvatore Extreme. Today we'll be covering do-it-yourself NSX maintenance part two. That'll entail putting the car up in the air. I'll go over changing the engine oil, information on changing the transmission fluid, what it takes to change the coolant, and also some information on things that I learned when I did the timing belt change that might help you if you're interested in changing your timing belt. One thing that I really like about the NSX that most people won't appreciate are the jack or lift points. They're very Honda-like. There's four and they're very distinguishable and easy to find. On most exotic cars, especially Lamborghinis and Ferraris, it's insanely difficult to figure out where to lift them. In the owner's manual, you get a picture or a diagram that is not very detailed and there's a lot of guesswork involved and they're so expensive. You definitely don't want to lift in a soft area where you might punch through one of those expensive carbon fiber under trays. The lift arms are in position, so I'm ready to go up in the air. If you don't have a lift, then I believe the best way to probably work on it would be using a lot of lumber and ramps. You can definitely get enough clearance to work on it and it won't be a huge problem. And the greatest thing about the NSX is it's a lot easier to work on than any Porsche, Ferrari, or Lamborghini. One major reason is, is because it does not have a dry sump system. The dry sump system is amazing, of course, as most of you already know, but for those of you that don't, it allows manufacturers to lower the center of gravity by lowering the engine. It runs a, an oil pump that actually scavenges to a reservoir that actually that same pump actually pumps the in oil into the engine, whereas this just draws straight from a pan. So a couple advantages are, one is there's not a ton of other things you have to work on. The other cars, I won't say are extremely hard, they're just more time consuming and more things you have to work on. You've gotta be conscious of a lot of under trays typically that are there, you have to pull them down to get access to a lot of stuff. In the air, the NSX was built, everything is still open. And also, since the engine is up higher, that also makes it much easier, of course, to change spark plugs and work on the top side. So, once you use the ramps, you can go ahead and get it up and work underneath. This is an oil analysis data sheet that's come back from the lab for engine oil. You can kind of take a look here and see what it's got. Is it necessary? No. Is it helpful? Yes. Right here, the lab green is good, okay? We'll give you then also some recommendations according to what they see. Right here, you've got the wear metals. Very useful because you can compare it to previous samples. It's gonna give you a good idea if something is degenerating or going bad. Now down here, the most important information to me is water, antifreeze, or fuel. If any of those tests yes, then that would lead me in the direction that there could potentially be another problem, but by far, the biggest problem being that I would need to tighten up the interval of changing the engine oil. Of course, right here, you've got the viscosity tested at 100 degrees Celsius. Very, very important. These four components, you can actually use as a very good tool. You could possibly extend your interval if you wanted to, but you also may need to tighten up the interval depending on what information you get from that. Since we're gonna be changing the engine oil, we wanna go ahead and pull the oil filler cap, set it aside, and cover the inlet with a rag to keep the contaminants out. Out of the NSXs I've worked on, in typical Honda fashion, I haven't come across any with any major oil leaks. Every now and then, I'll see some weeping coming out between the pan gasket. And in all the cases I've seen this, I've always been able to rectify it just by getting up there and actually tightening a little bit on the bolts. A 10 millimeter socket will get you in there. If you go all the way around, that's been what's worked for me. Here's a quick look at what comes in the old sampling kit. You can see there's a hose if you want to use a suction gun. There's a self-addressed bottle to send in the sample and the sample bottle is enclosed within. When you go to drain the oil, you just want to go ahead and go up to the plug, 17 millimeter socket, go ahead and undo it. I like to spin it out by hand. Have a pan underneath. Once it's free, go ahead and drop. Once the stream starts and you have some oils come out, you can go ahead and take your sample bottle, put it under the stream, fill it up to the top, and you've got your sample ready to go. Once all the oil's drained out of the pan, you can go ahead and send up it filter strap wrench or channel lock or anything that works then go ahead and spin off the filter 
Once the oil is down in the pan, if you see any contaminants or anything suspicious, there is another option versus oil sampling and sending it to the lab. What you could actually do is take the oil filter once it's down and cut it open to inspect the element. That is a course of action sometimes we have to take when we're in a hurry. And if you obviously see foreign contaminants in the filter element, then that is a bad sign of things to come. Everyone has their own opinion. Personally, I always like to use an OE filter. And the same thing goes with engine oil. Everyone has their favorite. Uh, for this, uh, for the NSX, I'm going to go ahead and use a Mobile One 530 Extended Performance. Through all of our testing through the lab, all the synthetic oils perform very well and the wear characteristics are very similar to each other. Pre-filling the oil filter is debatable and on one side I understand what people say you're sending oil in that will go unfiltered into the engine but my opinion of course is better to have unfiltered oil with minimal chance of contaminants versus no oil at all. So I will go ahead and completely preload the filter before I send it back up and then I'll take a thin layer of engine oil and just lubricate the gasket or o-ring. Next we'll go ahead and take the old washer or seal and pull it off. Wipe the plug down, make sure it's clean and put a brand new seal on it. Now we'll just send the plug up real quick by hand and go ahead and torque it down to 33 foot pounds. Next, we'll go ahead and send the oil filter back up. Once the filter is tightened down by hand completely, I'll usually go ahead and just give it a, a little bit more with either a filter wrench or a strap wrench. In this particular case, I'll go ahead and torque it to the spec of 16 foot-pounds. I've brought the car down now to go ahead and start filling the oil. The engine takes around five quarts of oil with the oil filter change. So I usually put in around four quarts, four and a half, and then double check the level with a dipstick. Popped off the engine with the five quarts of oil, double checked the oil level with the dipstick, which I'm sure you all know is right down here. We were at the full mark, pulled the funnel, put the oil filler cap back on. Now what I'll do to double check the engine level is, I'll fire the car three times, but I'll cut it short. So I'll go ahead and start it, and as soon as it lights off, I'll shut it off. That way I'll prime the system with oil and won't load the bearings dry. Then I'll go ahead and fire it on the fourth time, let it run for about 30 to 45 seconds. I'll shut it off, come back here, double check the level on the dipstick. If all is good, you're good to go. If not, again, the same thing, just pull the oil fill cap, top it off and you're all set. I just recently changed the transmission fluid but I will go ahead and go through it real quick for those of you that want to just do it on your own and have some information. Right here is a drain plug, 3 8 inch ratchet, go straight into the plug, pull the plug out, go ahead and drain the oil, replace the seal or washer with a new one, then go ahead and send it back in, torque it down to 29 foot-pounds. Then if you take a look up on top right there, you can see that is the filler plug. Get a 17 millimeter socket, go ahead and send it up right there. You break it loose, pull it out, then go ahead and fill the transmission. I like to use Redline MT90, everyone has their own favorite lubricant. Fill the level so the oil, once it starts coming out, you of course want to use a new washer seal on that plug as well. Send it back in and torque it down to 33 foot pounds. You saw from the testing that the antifreeze in the NSX is good, so I will not be changing the coolant. However, I realize that some of you may want to change or find when you test that you do need to change. So I'll go over it real quick and give you what information I can to possibly help you out. First and foremost, you want to make sure that the engine's cold. It's bad times to work on it when it's hot, it's under pressure. Actually a little bit dangerous as well. So what I would do is go ahead and loosen the cap on the expansion tank so you can go ahead and drain things quickly. You want to get inside the cab, turn the ignition on, slowly turn the climate control to 90 degrees, then go ahead and kill the ignition. That'll allow you to go ahead and drain the heater core as well. The first plug you want to pull is located on the bottom 
left of the radiator. It is plastic, so I recommend either using soft jawed pliers or possibly duck bill pliers with duct tape wrap around it. I don't remember for sure, but there may be an O-ring in there. So when you do pull the plug, inspect the O-ring to make sure it's in good condition. If it shows any sign of wear or damage, you would definitely want to replace that. There's a plastic tray secured by seven bolts that you can pull with a 10 millimeter socket that will expose the coolant pipes. And right here, you will see that there's two drain plugs. Again, they also use 10 millimeter. You want to go ahead and pull both of those out to drain the lines. There are coolant ports on the front and rear side of the block. It's helpful to cut a piece of hose to guide the coolant and to minimize the mess. Here in the rear, you can crack the valve by using a 14 millimeter on top and a 12 millimeter on bottom. That is the coolant port on the front side of the block. It is much more difficult than the rear. If you have a lot of trouble, you can go ahead and remove the under tray. How I usually do it is I use crow feet. I'll send up a quarter inch drive 14 millimeter and then a separate quarter inch drive 12 millimeter to break it and drain. Worst case scenario, if it's almost frozen, you can still use a crow foot, sacrifice using the drain pipe, and go ahead and send up a socket. Once all the coolant is completely drained out, you can close the valves on the block, remove the hoses, then move up here to the coolant pipes, go ahead and replace the washers, and put back in these plugs. After you put those plugs back in, you want to go ahead and put back up the plastic under tray. Just be careful when tightening it down because it is plastic. Then go back up to the radiator and put back in the radiator drain plug. The bleed cap for the heater core is found right there. The plug to bleed the radiator is right here. The upper bleed for the coolant pipe is located right there. The bleed for the thermostat housing is hard to reference, but I'm drawing back so you can get an idea of where it's at under the throttle body. Once all of the bleed screws are open, then what you want to do is go ahead and put your mixture together. I recommend a 50-50 distilled water and antifreeze mix. It's pretty much standard of the industry. Now what you'll do is you go ahead and start filling the expansion tank. Okay, go ahead and keep filling it until you get a steady stream out of all of your bleeds without any air bubbles. Now, the procedure to close the bleeds is very specific and I'm trying to remember exactly the way it goes, but I believe this to be correct. The first one you want to close is the bleeder on the thermostat housing. The next you'll go to the front of the car and you want to go ahead and put back in the bleeder plug and the radiator. Then you'll go to the bleeder cap for the heater core. And the last thing will be coming back here and closing the bleeder for the coolant pipe. Now I'll tell you that that's usually the biggest problem for me when I change the coolant is getting all the air out of the system. So you want to go ahead and start with that and then you'll move on to the next step. Once you feel that you have as much air out of the system as you can get, you'll go ahead and top off the reservoir again. I would like to take it all the way up to the top because you want to go ahead and bleed underneath the throttle body at the thermostat housing one more time. You'll crack that, go ahead and wash for any air Make sure everything is clear. Once you're confident of that, again, you'll fill the reservoir to keep it up to the top. Then at that point, you can go ahead and put the cap on the first click. You don't want to tighten it all the way down so the system will pressurize. Fire up the NSX. You want to pay attention to everything that's going on. The temperature gauge inside the car, everything should be working properly. If the temperature gauge isn't working, most likely there's air in the system and the coolant isn't actually even making contact with the temperature sensor. At that point, you've got to start over again and re-bleed from the very beginning. But if everything looks okay and the cooling fans come on, that means the thermostat's open. Coolant's circulating and should pull air back to the reservoir. You want to always keep an eye on the reservoir and make sure you're at the right level. Now, once that happens and the cooling fan is run and you're confident that the coolant is circulating, you can go ahead and shut off the NSX, top it off again. Now for me, because I've had problems, what I'll usually do is I'll leave the radiator cap off overnight and just let the car sit. And what that will do is allow the air to work its way out. But if you feel confident everything is good, you can go ahead and close down the reservoir and take it out for a drive. But like I said, you always want to make sure your level's good and watch for anything odd that happens because this car in particular is difficult to get all the air out of the system. Unfortunately, when I did the timing belt change on the NSX, I did not think I would be making videos to try and assist others in working on the NSX. So, I won't be going through a full timing belt change until that interval is due. And just to do it for a video, I would 
rather have a root canal than do that. But just a few tips that could possibly help you out if you're going to take it on yourself. The first is, it's not the hardest job ever, but I wouldn't say it was fun by any means. I've got a wide range of advice. Uh, some people that are skillful said drop the engine, uh, but of course, as you all know, the person that I listen to the most is George Kudo. He recommended doing it in car. I did do it in car, and if you follow the service manual very close, you'll be able to get the job done no problem. But a couple things is, one is a friend of mine who did the job actually torqued down the crank bolt and it still came loose. He lost the pulley and of course, as you know, catastrophic damage. So I would recommend on the crank pulley using red Loctite. Some of you may be completely against that, but my own opinion is I'd much rather be safe that that bolt is not gonna come out than, and possibly have to struggle next time getting it out and the possibility of failure. The next thing is experience from doing probably close to triple digits of these engine rebuilds myself. The can gears and setting everything up for top dead center. Even when you pin the cams with, I believe they recommend a five millimeter pin and that's what we would use to lock them in, they can still move just a little bit. So when you line up the timing belt, it may be almost what seems to be a half a tooth off. So the best way to double check the work is when you pull the pins, have the plugs out, slowly turn the crank a couple times. And I think what you're gonna find then is you're either on or you're off. And the marks, these aren't factory pulleys. These of course were made by AEM, especially for me to adjust my cam timing. But you can see the marks here. They line up right on. And then there's an indicator, of course, on my motor plate for top dead center on the crank. If that is off, it will be very bad times. So you just want to make sure that you are on before you close everything up. We've covered things that I believe will save time and money for the do-it-yourselfer. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.